This is a fantastic event that um, I'm really excited to introduce. Um, I'm Trisha Rose, and I'm the director for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. And we do lots of programming on a, a number of things, arts, political issues, social justice issues, the intersections of those for uh, Latinx communities, African American, Asian American, indigenous communities. We try to think about these groups both in their own right, but also in intersectional ways. And for this event, um, we were just really delighted to be able to bring three just phenomenal storytellers who I will let our terrific moderator tell you more about. Um, but this question of the stories we tell, just very briefly, and uh, the importance of telling a wide range of complex stories from the positions that we never hear from is, is more important now than ever. I'm sure you all feel exhausted by the complexity of uh, odd, odd and definitely untruthful storytelling as part of our mainstream society. And the more we can think about hearing from communities whose voices we don't hear and their lived experiences and traditions and communities, the better off we'll be. So we're delighted to contribute to that. But I can't really own the brainchild behind this event because it is the brainchild of Brigitte Santana, who's directly to my left, who is a fantastic master's student in the public humanities program at Brown University, who has also spent this last academic year being a curatorial fellow at CSREA. And she's been really a, a, just a, an advocate and a brilliant mind for thinking about types of events we might put together. She's curated next year's exhibit for the center. Um, and uh, she's just been a joy and a, and a pleasure to work with. Um, I'm just going to introduce her a little bit and let her introduce the panel and get started. So Brigitte, um, before coming to Brown as uh, in the MA program in Public Humanities, she worked for the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. She has a bachelor's in Latino, Latina studies from Columbia University, and she's interested in making museums and, and uh, public humanities generally more accessible and equitable places to work and visit online and in real life. And she's done that here for us today. So please join me in welcoming Brigitte Santana. Thank you, Tricia. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about each of our speakers. Uh, Dawn Dove is a Narragansett Niantic elder, daughter of Pretty Flower and the last traditional war chief of the Narragansett Nation. She is mother to two daughters and grandmother to 10 grandchildren. Dawn is a published author and editor of Through Our Eyes, an indigenous view of Mashapog Pond, edited by Dawn and Holly Ewald, and most recently, Dawn Land Voices, an anthology of indigenous writing from New England, edited by Shibhan Senye. Dawn is a cultural educator and traditional knowledge keeper. Dawn's life work is dedicated to the continuation of the culture, language, and traditions of her people. Marta Martinez is the founder and executive director of Rhode Island Latino Arts, the oldest Latino nonprofit arts organization advocating for Latin American arts, cultural heritage, and history in Rhode Island. She is also an oral historian and the founder of the Nuestras Raices the Latino Oral History Project of Rhode Island. Marta was awarded the 2016 Public Humanities Award from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. She will serve as a 2016-2017 Fellow in Public Humanities at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, where she will work on a project in col collaboration with the Providence Preservation Society entitled Exploring Places of Significance to Rhode Island's Latino Communities. And last but not least is Valerie Tootson, who graduated from Brown University in 1987. Um, it's her, her 30th year reunion. Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she had a self-designed major, storytelling as a communications art, and later a master's degree in theater. She is a founding member and executive director of the Rhode Island Black Storytellers and festival director of Funda Fest, an annual celebration of black storytelling. Since 1991, she has traveled the country and world teaching, gathering, and sharing stories and songs. In addition to telling stories herself, Valerie is committed to creating spaces where people can tell their own stories. Valerie has received numerous awards for her work in the community, including the Legacy Award from Big Brothers and Sisters of Rhode Island, a Community Service Award from Oasis International, and an Honorary Doctorate of Fine Arts from Rhode Island College. 
So these are all of our fantastic speakers who are with us today, and I will let Dawn do her presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it is certainly my pleasure to be here, and um, I wanted to say Natasuis Dawn Dove and Askwi Kwasonimus Nitangswag Ka Natangswag and Nitampuag. I'm just saying hello. Uh, to my friends and relatives that are here, and um, telling our stories. Katutam we thiank, natanitang kwat tanonash. Very special, and I'm so thankful and honored to be asked to be a part of this um, gathering. I want to especially say hello to all of the elders that are out here, and. I also want to uh, acknowledge my eldest daughter, Loren Spears, that's sitting in the front row, and I thank her for coming with me. Um, continuation. That's what storytelling is all about for us. It is um, to, to let the next seven generations remember. So we, we hold that in highest position. And in our tradition, normally when we start, we offer a prayer, thanksgiving. So I would like to do that now. Namanatuman. Napiauman indin kisquat. Nashbi kachikunai tahanoanash. Katepatatanash. Uchiwami Kmaguanash Namanatuman Katapatamish Kautantuad Uchiwami Numamani Tank Natanksua Ninach. Um, and what I said was great spirit or creator that we come unto you today with our quiet and thankful hearts. Um, we thank the Creator for all of the gifts, and we thank the Great Spirit for all our beloved relations. And in our way, all of our relations are not just who we are related to, but our relations include the four-legged, the ones that fly, etc., the stones, the trees. They're all, we are all a part of that. And, um, so we, we give thanks. And um, these are my two daughters and their families with my 10 grandchildren. Um, this was a book, Dawnland Voices, and um, I especially think that that is uh, something that I wanted to share with you because the editor, Sh Siobhan Sr., um, is a professor at UNH, University of New Hampshire, and what I so appreciate about Siobhan is that she was doing this work. She, she was collecting voices of the indigenous people of the Northeast. She didn't just go and do it on her own. What she decided to do was to contact as many nations as possible, and then within each of these books, uh, these sections within with the tribal nations, she went to, um, the nations and asked for someone to be an editor within. So I was the editor for the Narragansett section and I wanted to just share one small section uh, with you from that. My grandmother spoke to me of the beauty of our land and the waters as pain was visible on their faces. The pain of remembering what has been destroyed and stolen. In this project, we are compiling the written words of our people, yet there has been a terrible miscarriage of justice. The written words of our people of long ago 
have not been held in honor by the colonizers. So, but our words are in this book. I highly recommend it, uh, Dawnland Voices. And then the next book that I was the editor with, um, Holly Ewald, An Indigenous View of Mashapog Pond. And of course, Mashapog Pond is right here in Providence. Unfortunately, terrible pollution um, has made it so you can't even fish in it. But um, the work that is, you know, is trying to be cleaned up. But again, I want to honor uh, Holly Ewald. This was her idea for the book. And again, she went to the community. And I think that's the important thing, is taking the voice of the community and bringing it aloud. And so what we did with, um, we, we read histories, or we um, had guest speakers come in, or we um, just had elders speaking. And from that, um, the, we made collages, and we also wrote poetry, et cetera. And this one is called Sharing Mashapog Pond with All Creation. Um, the spirit of the people, our ancestors, traveled with us. Mishquam, red fish, red tears, fall from my heart. We travel together. We travel to meet the spirit people. Another one, this uh, collage was done actually by my granddaughter. And, um, she was pretty young at that time. Um, says, I feel desperation. Nokomis Nanapashit watches over the night. Grandmother Moon watches over the night. We travel by her light, we cry. Our home is safe. The beauty of the mats of the Wichu helped me have beautiful dreams. I am surrounded by beauty. I am safe in the swamp. The bark covering keeps out the cold wind. Stay close to me. And I wrote that thinking about the Great Swamp Massacre. And this is the last one from um, the Mashpog book. And it's, we live in balance. We are here. This is our land. Today and yesterday, we live in balance. So the, the original instructions have been given to us in stories. We spend time together on the land, in our homes, by the waters, sharing our stories, which allows for the continuation. Indigenous traditions told through our stories tell us who we are. They instruct us about our responsibilities to each other and to the Earth Mother. These teachings help us to remember who we are. Our peoples have always honored storytelling. There are stories of how things are made, how the animals came to be, and how our people lived. There are stories of why the birds sing, and also about how sometimes people are greedy, and other times how they are generous. And all of these help us to learn. There are stories about Nokomis Nanapashit, Grandmother Moon, Mishumas Kisak, Grandfather Sky. Stories are teachings. Stories are told at gatherings, socials, thanksgivings. Traditionally, stories are told in winter. They are used to inspire art, but they keep our traditions alive. Storytelling is how we survived. Spiritual power is given to us through stories. Traditionally, storytelling was an oral art form, passed down from one generation to the next. When you look here, we, we have that oral tradition. And um, on your right, uh, the book Strawberry Thanksgiving was written by my older sister, 
several years ago, and it takes those stories and, and brings a modern configuration to it. And, and we do, we're, we're, we're crossing that bridge. Sometimes it's difficult to write those words, but um, we still sh share and celebrate our histories and traditions through storytelling. Natani Tanquantanonash, our stories connect us to our beliefs. Through stories that have been passed down, we understand our ancestors' beliefs of life and death, spirituality, creation, the solar system, the solstices, the stars, the four directions. The Nahigansic people do not hold themselves above any of the great spirit's creation. We are all within the circle of life. We do not think of the things that grow on Mother Earth or the things that are found within as resources to be exploited. That is not our teachings. Our stories help us to respect all of creation, the standing ones, the grandfathers, the stones, those that crawl and those that swim and those that fly, and the four-leggeds. We're all a part of it. Our Nukomasag, our grandmothers, and our Mishumasag, our grandfathers, told us many stories that teach us how we should conduct ourselves, how we should be as human beings. Our stories are a gift to us from the Creator. They are medicine, a healing for the people. Hi everyone. Hello. So I, I, I felt I didn't bring a PowerPoint, but as I was thinking, I wanted to just put up this picture up while I talk because this person, uh, I was very inspired from what I heard, and it, and it inspired me to remember what it is that got me started on what I do. And so instead of telling stories, it, or my way of telling stories is by listening. Uh, I collect stories, and uh, I, I, people have referred to me as an oral historian. I'm an untrained oral historian. I've taken several workshops and I've learned um, all the tools of being an oral historian. Um, and what it really is is just listening to people. I grew up in the, the Mexican culture in the southwest uh, part of the United States in Texas. And part of the Mexican culture is similar to what the Native Americans do is we tell stories, we share our heritage and we share our stories. Um, by using um, music and, and folklore, um, and in my f and in many families, it's just sitting down around the table and sharing, just talking, whatever comes to mind. And I grew up 
inspired by my grandmother who used to sit for hours by herself. She, she was a, a cutting edge woman when I was young in the, or in the 1960s. She had her own business. She, um, I hardly ever saw her when I was growing up because she was always working. She ran several restaurants. She, she opened some diners. Um, so she wasn't always home, but when she was home, she, she would sit quietly in the living room and she smoked and, and I have uh, memories of her sitting there in the dark with just the, the, the smoke rising around her. And I used to sneak in and just, just sit next to her. And then eventually when she knew I was there, she really wouldn't look at me. She would just start talking to me and I really learned a lot about my own family history just sitting there listening to her talk. It was her moment of, of quiet to herself, but it was also a way of her just thinking about her life um, I, at the point of life that she had, she had arrived. Um, so I learned a lot about my family history, but it, most importantly, I just enjoyed listening. And that, that's really the tool that I carry with me. Um, I went through, through uh, my college as an um, English major, but I was really interested in journalism. I wanted to, to listen to people and, and hear what they say and, and listen to what, what the stories that they share and, and put them in the broader context of what was going around the world. And journalism to me was a way to do that. Uh, I didn't get an undergraduate degree in journalism, but I ended up eventually getting a master's degree when I, went, I graduated from George Washington University. But it was that, that interest in listening and, and really love of being around people and, and finding out who they are and what they do and, and, and learning about the world around me that, that got me interested in oral history. Um, I moved to Rhode Island and having come from the story that I just shared with you from a Mexican culture where we sit around and we, we know who we are. Um, our Mexican culture is found on the earth, basically. My grandmother used to say that you can just reach down and pick up the ground and, and it's your, your ancestors are part of that earth. Because uh, Mexico really owned part of uh, the United States. And um, so I, I grew up with that culture knowing, knowing that. But coming to Rhode Island, I didn't know much about the Latino community and I had been hired to work and represent the Latino community for a social service organization. And so I found, that, found uh, that it was important for me to learn about the Latinos in Rhode Island. So I went out and I just walked around and I listened. I, I used to visit storefront owners and talk to people. And the, the board president of my organization one finally told me, she says, so one woman that you really do need to talk to. I really think she's an important person in the community that, that you can learn from. And that person was, is this person up on the, on the screen. I met her, she was in her, at the time she was in her 50s. And she started telling me the story about how she came here. And I just happened to have, I don't know why, because I didn't always carry one. I had a little tiny tape recorder, the, the, the little micro cassettes, and I, I whipped it out. The minute she started talking, I just felt immediately that I needed to do that, and I recorded her story. And it was that story that was the basis of what, what has evolved into the, a, a 30 year collection of Latino oral histories of the community. Um, she, she basically, after listening to her, um, I, have, I have concluded that she, it, it was her and her husband and her family who really planted the seeds. And it was because of her that the Latino community is what it is today. And in listening to her story and, and realizing that as, as, a, as a family who arrived here in 1955, that's really not that long ago. It's 1955, it's, it's still tangible. And, and the fact that I was sitting there listening to her tell me that the create this history, um, I just continued from there collecting these stories. And, and it, was, it was then that I decided that that was a story that hadn't been told, that had, had, was not part of the history books. Is after listening to her story, I went uh, into the places like the Rhode Island Historical Society, the public libraries. I went everywhere trying to find what I can add to this or what can her story add to, and there really was nothing, at least in writing, in the books. And so that's when I took it upon myself to create, to create, put, to put these voices <clears throat> of a community that had never been documented before. And out of that um, came this, 30 year collection of stories that I have unfold, that I have uncovered uh, and have published a book. And, and I do go primarily to schools because I feel that there are young people today that don't realize the history that their own families carry. 
similar to the history that I used to listen to when I sat at my grandmother's feet. That it, it really meant a lot to me and I still carry it. And it, it, it has made me the person I am today. And I feel that these young people just take it for granted, don't realize what their, their own family members have gone through. All the stories of struggle, coming to a culture, being the first Latino in Rhode Island, not having the resources that they have today, interpreters, um, being able to uh, walk outside and read Spanish. And if you don't know how to communicate, you can just turn to somebody in your neighborhood and have them do it for you. So Doña Fefa here in this picture was taken last September. She, um, she's 89 years old now, and she's still alive, very spry. And, and again, that's really the, the, the beauty of, of my project and the, and the fact that she's still there. And if I, I want to continue putting more value into the stories of, uh, that have been untold in Rhode Island, I can just go to her and she can uh, she can act as a role model. She has spoken to, to people, and she really does represent that the beginning of that history, um, and, and and has helped me uh, put a um, put a face on, on what could be considered intangible history, making it more tangible. Having her there to to really represent what the Latino communities are today, and uh, what the story of this of the different groups of the Guatemalans and the Colombians. So, so FEFA came from the Dominican Republic. And so that, that's, that, those untold stories of the um, immigrants that first came to Rhode Island, um, she was the, the inspiration and continues to be the inspiration for me today. So thank you. But I do need to stand up. And um, I need to share with you something that I share with everyone, which pretty much sums up a lot of my practice and my vision for storytelling. Uh, and I'm going to, so I'm going to share a couple things with you. Oh, don't, you can look at that. Yeah, actually, keep the CD there for now. That's fine. Um, thank you for putting that there, because hopefully I'll figure out how to do that. I'm, I'm not going to get to that first. Uh, when I uh, was getting interested in storytelling, I spent a lot of time doing a couple things. Sitting with my grandparents and my parents and bugging them for stories, which they did not feel were all that interesting until I kept bugging them and bugging them. And I come from an interracial family. My mom was white, my dad black. They married in 63 before the March on Washington. So it's been an interesting uh, experience to pull the stories from them. It was actually my Scottish grandmother who said, when you know the stories and songs of your people, then you know better who you are and who you could be. And I knew when I came here to Brown 34 years ago that there wasn't a lot that I knew about black people or a lot that I knew about African people in particular. So Ma, it was really important for me to delve in, I, wasn't, I didn't have the history in my schools, we were removed from a large portion of our African-American family. Um, and again, I knew nothing about Africa. And so that was really important to me because I knew even in my bones that there was way more to the black experience on this planet besides slavery. So when I got here, I was able to begin that exploration. I know kids today get to explore it much earlier than I did, but you know, it's my 30th reunion. Anyhow. I have a friend, his name is Masanko Banda, and he comes from Malawi. And he speaks Chichewa, and he taught me a song that he grew up singing. And he teaches it everywhere he goes. And I said, Masanko, can I teach that song too? He said, please, because this song is going to change the world. This song is going to heal the world. And this is the greeting song that he grew up singing. It goes like this. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, moni. The words da kuo na mean I see you. And moni means I greet you with respect. 
So with our voice and our body, we say, I see you with my eyes, I see you with my heart, I see you in front of me, and I greet you with respect. So get your hands ready. Because in African traditions, there's not really a spectator or a sport. All right? So everybody gets invited and everybody's expected to participate. I have a, another one of my teachers who says, hey, if you're not having a good time, it's your fault. <laughs> the whole point is to participate. Okay, so y'all ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, moni. Do it again. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, moni. Okay, that's really good. Now you sang to me. Now this is the really fun part. Turn to your neighbor or someone in front or behind you. <laughs> Look them in the eyes and let them know that you see them. And you greet them with respect. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, mo. Turn to somebody else. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na. Find one more person because you sound so good. Da Because for me, storytelling is a participatory experience. It's one that even if you're not actively engaged in, when you're listening, you're still participating because it touches us in ways that just having a con uh, no conversation does. But it, 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 it moves our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. And it's something that we share together that we, may, that we sometimes can't even put words to. I'm going to tell you one little other story, um, which is also an example of what storytelling, I think, does in the world, or um, can do in the world. And this I heard a preacher say one time, down there at the State House. I don't remember who he was, I don't remember what the event was, but I've never forgotten the power of this story. And it's an African tale. There was a family that went down to the river. They were going to go fishing. And there were three generations. There were the grandparents, the parents, and the children. And when they got down there to the river, the grandparents and the parents were going to get in their boats and they were going to go out fishing. And they left the children right there along the river's edge. And they said, be careful. Don't fall asleep. Stay awake or the animals will come and get you. The children said, oh, of course, of course, of course. And the parents and grandparents went out into the water. And the children did what the children do, you know. They played along there, alongside the water, and then, oh, they started getting a little bit sleepy. They wandered off, and pretty soon, they weren't paying any attention, and they fell right asleep there on the banks of the river. And of course, as soon as they fell asleep, there was a great big cat that started to make its way through the brush alongside that river. And that cat was getting closer and closer. And the parents and the grandparents could see that that animal was about to attack the children. And as soon as the parents saw that, they turned and they started to move their boat close to the shore. But there was a wind and they kept getting pushed back. And they were trying harder and harder and harder. But there was no way they were going to get to the edge of the shore on time. And the grandparents said, stop. Stop trying to reach them. We can yell together. We can wake the children, and they will save themselves. And so they did. And so they did. I've never forgotten the power of that story, a simple tale with a strong message. 
We need those old stories, the healing stories, the wisdom stories, and the chance to sit in community to hear our elders and to hear the people that we know or don't know or think we know. So at the Rhode Island Black Storytellers, we've been doing, uh, we started it out calling it gumbo gathering. We call it community flavors. And it's an opportunity for people to come together and sit around the table and share stories. In January, we had 80 people come. March, we had 50. The last couple weeks ago, we had 73. All ages simply coming together to share a meal <coughs> and to share stories. There are people who have brought friends from across town because they've heard of this experience. And next week, it's kind of a secret, but not really, 300 people are invited to come and sit at one big table downtown next Thursday night to kick off um, the Providence PVD Fest. Uh, and we will be sharing stories around the table. So I do hope that you'll come and join us for that. And there it is. I'll stop there. <laughs> So I guess I'm really interested in exploring some questions related to both form and content. So I'll start with form. Um, how do you usually prepare um, to tell a story? And how do you prefer to structure your stories? I usually prepare by bookmarking a ton of websites um, and then you know, going through them later. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I guess I just try to remember them. <laughs> Fair. Well, I record most of my, my stories, and so I, I do remember them as they're happening. And as, I re as soon as I record them, I go back and transcribe them, because the act of transcribing really cements them in, in my head. And, um, and then as, before I actually share them, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have the, either the transcript or the oral interview to listen to. If I'm uh, working with folklore, the wonderful thing about folklore stories is that they, they have a pretty solid structure, right? So there's often a character who goes off and runs into trouble and needs some help to get better. <laughs> and so knowing story form is helpful um, for the folklore also, sometimes I, if I've heard it, I might jot something down. Um, but for me, it's also what do I see in my mind? What do I remember in the visions? Um, I don't do a lot of writing specifically being uh, married to the words. Right? And, I tr and I also try to think about what's the most important thing about this story. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, do you rely on different modalities to get your stories across, like visual and written? Um, and how, what role does technology play in what you do? <laughs> Has it hurt or helped or been neutral? I think when I'm storytelling, I'm not using, although today it was a lot of fun getting all those images off of the internet to, to help with uh, what I wanted to share with you today. But I think usually with storytelling, it, you, you try to convey the image with the word, maybe with a movement, a, a bit of a, a movement. But um, it is trying to, to get our audience, our family, our friends, our relatives, to kind of go back and, and remember where we have been, who we were before. And I think that's what the stories try to, to em embrace. For me, uh, images are very important. Whenever I, I do talk to somebody and I set up an interview with them in, in advance, I ask them to try to go back and look for photographs mm -hmm. 
or, or objects that would spark, because it's usually those kinds of things that help them. Uh, that, and I come in with a, a few sets of questions, but it, it's those objects that really end up being the subject of the discussion that really, because they must have picked that photo or that object for a reason. It was important to them. It was meaningful, and so that's really, uh, again, a, 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 I have an idea of what I want to get, but sometimes I don't even go there because they really, that whatever it is that they chose was important to them, and I let them work with that. I've had a sort of changing view uh, or battle with this notion of technology and storytelling. Uh, I think that there are some really wonderful things around recording the stories. You know, we have access to people telling their stories in ways that we didn't have before, um, which I think is so important because who uh, the power is in who tells the story, right? So if you are, if your story isn't ever out there for people to hear, then uh, your sphere is limited, and also your mar you can be marginalized, or the dominant society marginalizes you. Now, when technology first, you know, powerpoints and all of that stuff, and I thought, well, as a storyteller, particularly with young people. I want to use technology, so I thought I'll do you know, this and that. But now, I never really did that because I'm not really good, which is why I'm so impressed with myself for bringing these <laughs> pictures here today. Not that I put them up there very well. It was Christina who did that. Uh, anyhow, um, now though, because everything is given to them through a screen, <laughs> they literally hold everything in the palm of their hand in ways that they didn't even do five years ago. I am becoming radically the opposite. In fact, I, I sometimes will bring a couple of props, which I like to, but the other day I couldn't find my prop basket and I thought, oh, what's, you know, Technology wasn't this, but it was, oh, I gotta show them this, or I got, I didn't have it, so I didn't use it. And, kin, you know, these are kindergartners through sixth grade, and one little girl said, I could imagine everything you said. Wow. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because when they're fed images all the time, how do you learn to dream or remember? or make your own pictures coming from your own internal imagining, not taking somebody else's form and changing the colors, but your own internal dreaming and visioning. And how do the different audiences um, influence what kind of stories you tell? Or um, do you tell the same stories to all audiences? Well, I choose the same story, but uh, the audience does dictate it. And, and I, I found myself, as I said, talking a lot to young people because I think it's important that they start learning this history that I've collected. So that does influence it. And it, it does, and it's, to me, it's very important when there's a Latino audience or, or primarily a Latino audience or not, the way I tailor it. Um, and, and going back to the technology question, to me, it wasn't until I actually, so I collect the stories, I transcribe them, and they were in a drawer for a long time, or in my head, mm -hmm. and, I, and I told them. But it wasn't until I actually put them out there on the internet they, that they really took off. I mean, they became public, and, and I could, I, and for me, it was more, it's not just about telling the story to young people that makes a difference, but it's also putting it out there to researchers and to journalists and to getting those stories out there where they belong. So it wasn't until that I developed the, a, a website that they, they became really visible and they more impactful. People could, I could talk about them and then I could refer for them to the website. As a uh, someone who loves the internet. One of the first things I found when I moved to Rhode Island and screens, unfortunately, um, was your website. And so reading the stories of, of people who had moved to Rhode Island from uh, Mexico and Guatemala, um, it was really helped to anchor me here in a way, and it was very um, rewarding. So I'm glad that you're all experimenting with the different modalities because you never know who you're going to reach. Um, and I, I want to oh, yeah. just, just uh, add to that. I'm thinking, I mean, technology certainly is wonderful, and I'm thinking um, a few years ago, I told the story of um, how the, the Big Dipper came to be in the sky. And, and I've told that story, gosh, 
over 40 years, I don't know how many years, 50 years. Got and, and I've heard it many, many times before. But this one particular time, I think I told it the best ever. You know, I get just, and sometimes you're just that way. It's like it was, and there was a person in the audience who had asked if they could put a little recorder. And I had said, sure, and please send it to me when, you know, afterwards. And the story was great. The person recorded it, and the person left, and they never sent me a copy of it. Oh. And I certainly <laughs> wish I had that. <laughs> but, you know, that it would be great to, to be able to put it on um, the Tomaquag Museum website. Oh. Yeah, sure. And, and, I, and I, so I agree with you that, that it is an important thing, but it's, but it is. There's a part of it, though, that when you're alive and you're with a certain group of people, yeah. I, it's, um, I don't know, if, I don't know that it should be there on, on live, I, on the internet, I don't know. It, there's, it's like kind of like you're almost stealing my heart or my soul yeah. or, or whatever. So there's those, it's an issue, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And also, like you said, some, you tell it differently at different times, so if it gets recorded, even on paper, you know, that's one of the things that for myself as a, you know, somebody who often is going through collections of stories, sometimes people think that that's the way it is, but that's the way it was told in that moment if somebody's written it down or recorded it. But that, it, stories live on the breath, ultimately, right? So somehow, even with technology, um, I think that you know, that's why it's kind of bittersweet. Like, don't think just because you have this recording that this is the way the story goes. Mm -hmm. It was that in that moment. And how do you know when you've told a, a successful story? Is it in the audience reaction or? When kids come up to you later and start telling it back to you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Not exactly the way they heard it or they read it, but that they knew it. Oh yeah, that's the one I read and then they tell it all to you. <laughs> yeah. And has your process of storytelling evolved over time? Um, it seems like it's very like transient in each moment. It's a kind of different experience. I think it is different each time. I think of my older sister. She, she has become quite renowned in her storytelling. But I was, in our family, of my siblings, I was the first to be a storyteller. And she kind of laughs at, I used to kind of, um, demonstrate as I was telling the story. So we're, we're paddling the canoe, so I would do these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, so she, she would think that was, that was kind of funny to see me doing that. But um, it, it does change. Each time it changes. So. What is your advice for aspiring storytellers? If there's any, like, best practices of a good story? I don't think it's possible to tell a story that you don't love. Mm. And, and I think those stories have a teaching that's very important. Um, yeah, that it's meaningful in some way. So like I'm not from Rhode Island, I'm not Dominican, Guatemalan or anything, but it's very meaningful to me just knowing that these stories are, are, are meaningful to someone else, that they're getting something out of it, if not now, later. Are stories something that you listen for during the day? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what? pay attention to, I guess. Um, not necessarily that it means I'm going to tell somebody else. But I also think, you know, I don't know if you do this ever, but also, you know, I start framing my life in story, or if an event happens, then I might not just be able to tell a little piece. I got to give you the before and the shun and the after. <laughs> <laughs> what makes a, like a truly compelling story to you? For me, that I don't know. I would, whenever I, I hear a story, I always want to know whether it's a truth or there's any truth to it. Mm -hmm. The truth in that, did somebody live that story? Mm -hmm. Is that somebody's story? Whether it's become a little bit of a fancy, but how much, is there even a little bit of truth to mm -hmm. it? Somebody's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, you know, I'm just thinking um, within uh, the Dawnland voices. I mean, yes, there are stories, but they are um, certainly teachings of of our life history and, and the historical trauma that we as indigenous people to this place have gone through. And, and I, I think it's important for, for our own healing to share that. So um, those are some of the things that are important. Mm -hmm. And for me, I listen for um, how it connects to the person who's telling it. Is this really resonating with them for whatever reason? Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of story it is in that way, for me, uh, if, it, if I can feel that it means something to that person, be it a folk tale or a joke or you know, some funny thing that happened on the bus or whatever, or, or the story of how you came or the loss of somebody, Whatever uh, rings true for that person is what draws me in. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, the, the idea of oral histories is, is putting uh, a, a voice to what, what could be an event. So oral histories really are done on, uh, the broadly. There, there was a historical event that happened, and the oral historians bring the voices to that, sto to that event. And to me, that, that's what's important, is bringing life to uh, an event, whether it was a historical moment, the, immigrate, the, pro the, the story of immigration. It, it, immigration isn't a story until you hear those voices. If there's a, a catastrophe, so if there's something that happens in the news, you hear about it, but I want to hear the voices of the people who were there. So it's the voices, to me, that resonate, that really bring it to life, that connect me to that moment in time. And what role does, um, does geography play in your stories of Rhode Island and Providence, or you know, more globally? Well, I think place is very important to, to us um, in terms of you know, the Narragansett. This, you know, this is our homeland. This, we don't come from someplace else. This is it. And um, our ancestors are buried here. And, um, I carry a lot of a lot of grief with me, and it's um, daily. Mm -hmm. So it's and a lot of the voices that I bring to life aren't from here, but they, they originally. But it is now their home, and so that's the story I want to tell. I came from this other place, but now this is my home, and this is what my home is like, and this was what my journey was like, um, and this is what I contribute to where what my where I live now. So so geography and that the before. But the now is more important than the before, the past. And I would say traveling a lot with, as a storyteller, that um, learning the stories of a people in a place is, is vital to the experience, if you really want to experience any kind of place. Um, and when we share stories around table, especially if we don't come from the same place, often we find that even whatever the prompt is, whether whatever the object is or the photo, it does give whoever is sharing um, that grounding of place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.